Hey, this is Krista Makes from Less Than Jake and Krista Makes a Podcast, and you're listening to Fascination Street Podcast. I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Chris DeMakes, the lead singer and guitarist of Less Than Jake, the ska punk band that started in 1992 and is still going strong today. In this episode, we talk about why he got into music, why specifically punk and ska. We talk about some of the crazy cool shit that he's gotten to do as part of that band, including their own custom shoe from Vans, and somehow managing to get the vinyl rights for all of their records. That is amazing, even from big, huge record companies like Capitol Records and Interscope. That is so dope. We also talk about his book, Blast from the Past, what it's about and why he decided to do it. He has a side project where he writes custom songs for people and companies and podcasts. That's super dope. And then we talk about his podcast, Chris DeMakes Podcast, which is a songwriting podcast in which Chris and writers of super popular songs sit down and talk about how the song was written, what they were thinking when they wrote this, what went into the musical production, what is that noise I can't figure out in that song, what instrument is that? This is a great podcast, even if you're not trying to sit down and analyze the technical breakdown of a song. It's really cool to hear some of these stories of how this happened or why that happened from some of the biggest songs of your lifetime. Definitely check it out. It comes out every Monday, just like this does. Krista makes a podcast. And don't forget to check out Less Than Jake. They're always on tour and they're doing festivals all over the place in 2023. And this is is my conversation with the singer from Less Than Jake and the host of Chris DeMakes a podcast, Chris DeMakes. Yeah. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Chris DeMakes. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fantastic. I have one very first question. What kind of fucking punk rock star is up this early, bro? I know. I know, right? Well, uh, in all fairness, it is 10 o'clock here. Uh, it's not only nine where you're at Central Time. But I, I've actually been up for about four hours, though. I have a f- uh, five and a four-year-old, if that tells you anything. That's why. Yes. When you have kids that are young you get up early when you have kids that are older you can't sleep Mm -hmm. so my kids are uh 30 and 31 and i don't feel like i've gotten a good night's sleep in 12 years (laughs) you did an opposite of me you started early i started late so but yeah it's actually it's actually really good uh even before my, my kids came along i was getting up a lot earlier than I did in my early days. So early to bed, early to rise. And I actually, I get so much more done that way. So I can't imagine, uh, you know, reverting to old habits and sleeping all day. Isn't it crazy how much shit you can get done if you get up early and your day is so much longer and nobody bothers you for those first few hours? That's exactly it. That's why I get up early. I get the emails done and, you know, kind of get my day in order. It's great. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Krista Makes. That Krista Makes. The founding member and lead singer and guitarist of the punk slash ska band, Less Than Jake. It started in 1992. Did I say all that right? Or just the word ska? Uh, Not at all. Not at all. Oh, good. All right. So first, I want you to tell me where you were born and raised. So I was born in Michigan, uh, outside of Detroit. And I lived there till I was about uh, almost seven. My family moved to Florida. My dad was in the auto industry in Michigan, and that took a hit in the early 80s. And he moved down to Florida. He had a friend down there that was doing real estate. And he said, you got to come down here. This area is hot. And my dad rounded the family up, brought us down to Florida. And 
It's funny how your life pans out. Had we never went to Florida, I never would have met the guys in my band, most likely. So how all the little pieces of the puzzle add up are pretty crazy. But moved us to a little coastal town on the Gulf Coast of Florida called Port Charlotte that recently got hit by that hurricane uh, that came through Florida. So that's where I grew up. It's so crazy to think that I was only there for 10 years of my life. It seemed like so much longer, but when I was just a couple months shy, 18, I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville, and that's where I connected with, with the rest of the guys in the band. Our original drummer, Vinny, who I started the band with, uh, he also was from Port Charlotte. We went to high school together, and we both traveled up to Gainesville and found the rest of the guys and started gigging, and the rest is history. So I guess we should take this time to adequately thank Datsun, Nissan, Honda for wrecking the American car industry in the early 80s and forcing your dad to get down there and, uh, and hang That's out right. in Florida. I, re I really love that. I actually thought you were doing a, a sponsor spot just now uh, in the middle of this. That was great. <laughs> <That'd be hilarious. laughs> so thank you japanese car makers because now we have less than jay there you go well, my dad actually worked for chrysler so it was an american automaker but yeah yeah i know but it was the japanese automakers that came in and sort of disrupted all of correct, that correct so. correct thanks guys okay so you and your boys started a band and y'all started playing why ska why punk why that style of music? Well, You're, I mean, I can't imagine there's a whole lot of punk and ska down in Gainesville, Florida in the early 90s. Um, punk there was. It was kind of really happening late 80s, early 90s, the punk scene uh, in Gainesville. You know, Gainesville was back then for sure the only blue spot in the state. It was a liberal hippie town. And, and the turnover there, why like college towns are so exciting and, and why they have such great music scenes, in my opinion, is every four months, the soil is tilled with new people coming in. There's always new people coming in to go to school and for what, whatever else. And in terms of musicians, there's always someone else new to play with. And it was a great scene. The ska thing. Vinny and I were really into tons of punk rock and our early stuff was pretty much just three piece band punk rock. And then we slowly added horn players along the way. Uh, there was a band from England called Snuff that had a trombone player, a punk rock band that had trombone that we really loved that were an, an influence early on. But yeah, you should have seen us pulling into some of these North Florida uh, redneck bars with blue hair and tattoos and, and nose piercings in 1992 playing the kind of music we were doing. It was uh uh, it was eye-opening for a lot of people. Was it scary for you guys? There were times, yeah. I mean, alcohol in the in the wrong type of crowd <laughs> could could turn on you. So yeah, there was definitely, but it was it was more the element of our whole thing in the early days was they're probably not going to like our music no matter what we do. So let's at least make them remember us. We would go in and destroy clubs. You know, we would go to like thrift stores and I'd say, I'd make up some story at the front. Hey, we're here for toys for kids for Christmas or something. <laughs> you know, here's 10 bucks. Could we take all your stuffed animals? And it'd be some, you know, college kid clerk behind the desk going, whatever, man, here, fill up a bag. And we'd bring stuffed animals and, you know, there'd be two feet of cotton and, and stuffing in, the, in these venues after we get done. The audience would rip them apart and silly string was a big thing. We'd buy hundreds of cans of that and hand it out to the crowd. And, and it, it was all about a spectacle and a, and a party and to have fun. That's what our band was built on. And it, it worked really well. Some of our early shows were insane. The, one of the groups that uh, latched onto us very early on was the surfing club at the University of Florida. And these guys were just a, it's like picture Sean Penn in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. It was just that dude like, hey man. And like, they were party animals, these guys. And they'd invite us to one of the guys' houses on campus and it, the parties there were epic. So very early on, it was, it was known that we were a fun band. I feel like the fun aspect and the doing weird, wild, crazy, unique shit never stopped. Like you're still doing some crazy shit. I mean, you guys just recently did a partnership with fucking vans, bro. You got your own van. And I think they're right behind you. They you are, got your own yeah. vans now. How cool yeah. is that? It's it's awesome, you know, and, and these are relationships that we've cultivated, you know, over the years of being a band. We met uh, Steve Andorn from Vans back in the 97 Warp Tour, and, and mm -hmm. we've done how many Warp Tours with them and all their representatives and just wonderful people. And so, we, you know, we, we have these wacky ideas and we hit these people up that we're friends with. Hey, would you be interested in nine times out of 10? They, they want to do something with us. You know, we've made some really good friends over the years. And. 
I don't think it can be stressed enough that this is a band of kids who got together in 1992 and 30 years later, you guys are still together. You're still a band. You're still kicking ass. Sure. There might be some different members here and there, but it's not all that common for a bunch of kids to stick to something, anything for 30 years and be really good at it and successful. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're just doing you guys a favor to do these partnerships. You, you guys are bringing some shit to the table. I mean, Taylor guitars, you guys are giving fucking guitars away at shows now. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing. You know, I was looking for an acoustic for my studio during the lockdown, during the pandemic. And I had got a rep's name, Jay Parkin, from Taylor Guitars out in San Diego. And Jay's a wonderful guy. I got his number and, and I said, hey, could you talk? I kind of want to get a guitar built, you know, and I wasn't looking for a freebie or anything. I, would, I was going to pay for this guitar. And he gets on the phone and he's just like, the first minute or so was just kind of very awkward. And finally he just leveled and he's like, man, you guys are one of my favorite bands. I love you guys. And I'm like, whoa, you know, and we've just built this wonderful friendship. And Taylor's whole thing is very grassroots. What less than Jake has built our career on, you know, we've, we've never looked, set our sights on, oh, we got to be the biggest band or have the huge hit. I mean, that would have been great. But that never really happened. It's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. We're just kind of like the tortoise, just kind of cruising along. And we get these cool little job opportunities. And, you know, this pool of money comes in or this tour comes in. And, you know, that's how we build. It's never been like, oh, we struck it rich here. It's like we're just going along doing our thing. And Taylor's kind of got that in mind. You know, the, their whole thing is, yeah, we could get you know, John Mayer or some of these big guys, but you know, the, how busy are they? Are they going to retweet and promote us like a band like Less Than Jake or maybe Newfound Glory would? And some, so that's who they've been aligning themselves with and it's worked out well for them. Well, I think that is rad. I love that 30 years in, you guys are still doing new little one-off and uh, partnerships with other I, th I just think that's the coolest fucking thing. So uh, Less Than Jake started in 1992. You guys signed your first record deal, I believe, in 1995. Is that right? Yeah, 95. Okay. This is one of my favorite questions that I've never asked before. How long after your first record deal did you guys first start hearing the phrase sell out? And did you guys collectively have a conversation about the implications of that and, and what the fuck that even meant? Oh, yeah. We, we, we heard sell out before we even had a record deal. I mean, you, you were a sellout if you, if you gave uh, an interview to the wrong zine back then. And for those who don't know what a zine is, it was short for a magazine. Everyone would just do these Xerox little punk magazines. And, you know, we heard that term early on. I hated the term and I never bowed to that term. I hated it because some of my favorite athletes, I'd, I'd look and be like, well, why isn't Michael Jordan called a sellout? He's got a $5 million contract this year, plus a $10 million contract with Nike. No one's screaming at him or, or any of these other famous stars. Why can't you be a musician and have success and do what you want? And yeah, follow a money trail. If someone's going to give me money to promote me, cool. If someone has a problem with that to this day, then that's on them, not me. I don't care. You know, as I know, it wasn't driven about the money, but if there was money there, who's going to turn that down if, if it felt right? And that was the thing for us. It had to feel right. You know, we never just looked for a money trail. And there have been things that have been thrown at us over the years that we have turned down that could have been lucrative, that we just... We didn't really feel it or didn't really want to get behind it. So at the end of the day, if there was money to be made or if there was a label or anything, I, we never shied away from it. I, I didn't shy away from it. As far as being a sellout, I want to point out two things. One, Michael Jordan was selling hot dogs, ladies and gentlemen, and nobody fucking said that about him. The two, it's hard to pay your electric bill with good vibes and cool energy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's funny because how things are now, n nobody can, it used to be back in the day, like you had to get on the right record label. If you were on the wrong record label, it's like, oh, they're on that label. They suck. You know, there was all these rules. There's nobody today that cares about what label, label you're on. There's not a label we could go to that someone would be like, why, why are you working with them? You know, and, and even us going out and doing stuff with other bands. I mean, we've always pushed the envelope. You know, we've toured with bands that are outside of our genre, within the genre and, and everything in between. So it was always about keeping our options open and, and furthering the band and hopping from, again, one small project to the next. Back then when you guys, I think it was on your first record deal, you guys did something unsane and I've never heard of it before or since. Somehow you guys got 
the specific vinyl rights. How did you do that? And whose idea was it to write that in that, you know what? Yeah, we're going to sign with this record company, but we're going to retain the rights to all vinyl. How? Well, because the labels, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll tell you, let's back up a little bit. I remember the first product that our band put out was a seven inch called Smoke Spot. It was in May of 93. It was on the No Idea label out of Gainesville. Was that the pizza box one? No, that came later. Okay. But uh, the first record we did, I remember my father saying, why are you putting out a 45? He didn't even call it a seven inch. Why are you putting out a 45? Like vinyl doesn't sell. My dad was like, you know, a real band has a CD or at least a cassette with a real printed cover on it and a printed uh, writing on the cassette. But we came from the punk rock world. Vinyl never died. So when we did the deal with Capital, we knew we were going to be doing vinyl, both singles and LPs. And nobody at the bill, they couldn't care less. Because vinyl was passe. They're like, well, this isn't going to sell. They weren't pressing up vinyl records in the 90s. All those vinyl reissues came within the last 10, 15 years. If that, you know, last 10 years, really, where you're, you're seeing vinyl in Walmart and in all these places now. Uh, you go in Best Buy, you'll see vinyl. You won't see CDs. So for us, it was just part of the punk rock culture where we came from. We knew that we wanted to continue doing that. And we retained those rights. The label didn't bat an eye. How has that worked out for you? For the band, I mean. It's worked out in genius proportions because those early records, those major label records that we did, are some of the band's biggest work. So the, the fact that we retain those rights to do vinyl, we're always doing reissues. You know, we're going to be doing a 30-year reissue next year of Hello Rock View that we have planned. So the fact that we don't have to give that money back to Capitol Records or Warner Brothers Records, in essence, and, and we're able to retain that is genius because we're selling way more vinyl product now than we are streaming or CDs or any, any other medium. I love that. That is fucking amazing. I love that whatever teenage you and teenage y'all came up with an idea and stuck to it that's going to benefit middle-aged you guys. I, I love that the little kid was looking out for future you. Well, yeah, I got lucky too. You know, uh, people ask all the time, you know, how did you make it? Or how'd you get in the band? And I always tell them it, it's one part luck, one part finding the right people, another part determination and will. You have to find the right people that are like-minded with you. And I found some incredibly talented and smart people to work with. And our combined brain was always analyzing things. You know, there was times when it was very frustrating. There still is in this band because there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen and it gets difficult because we're all thinking and we're all, you know, there's people that think a little more analytically than other people. There's people that think a little more outside of the box, think this way. And when we all come together, you know, we typically all form a consensus of what we feel is the right decision to go forward. And all those things we're talking about, like the vinyl thing that was talked about, that was labored over. And that was like, if we sign this deal, that's what we want. And again, that was, <laughs> that was one of the least of Capitol Records worries of vinyl, whatever. They weren't thinking about it and they should have. So does Less Than Jake own any of its masters? Yes, we own most of our masters except for the major label stuff. So like if we wanted to release like new stuff on CD or, or, or stream and this and that, and even the vinyl stuff, we have to license it back. We have to pay a fee, but it's not like if they own the vinyl rights outright. Right. So yeah, ultimately we'd love to own those recordings, but we owe that's the thing is most people don't, don't understand. Very few bands pay back their debt to a major label. It's the best loan, legal loan shark scheme in the world, as, as a lot of people know. Doesn't bum us out. It's the way that it is. Maybe we, in another dimension, we sold 10 million records and you know, we were able to go back and negotiate those masters or whatever. But our career has been what it is. There's, there's nothing I would change because I still see all the upsides of everything we've done, even the bad stuff. We're still here. We're still the tortoise cruising along, doing our thing. We get along probably better than we ever have as a band. And that's huge because none of us have to do this in the band. We have other options in our life to do. We do it because we still enjoy it. I love it. A lot of bands and relationships of all kinds break up when people go through you know, different stages of growing up. And since y'all all made it through the growing up phase together, 
And then now you guys are full grown ass adults who have other options and don't even really quote unquote need each other, but y'all still do it for the love of the game. That's what everybody strives for. So I hope, and I'm sure you guys do look at that for the gift that it is. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> How many times do you get together with friends and they're complaining about their coworkers? And you know, I could complain about my band members too. We all have our thing. At the end of the day, we have it pretty good. We know we do. You know, we get to go out and still live our dream and we get to do it on our terms too. We have no label behind us saying you have to tour behind this product. You have to get out there. We go out when we want to go out. You know, we did three separate three-week tours this past summer. So back in the day, we just would have left for two and a half months. And that would have been the end of it. But we all have families now. We're older. You know, from a physical standpoint, I could still go out and play 30 days in a row. It's all mental. You get older and, you know, what was once super exciting playing 12 shows in a row isn't that exciting anymore. It just isn't. You change. So we, we structure our career differently and we're able to, hey, we're going to go out for three weeks. Cool. Can I handle that? And we'll come home for three weeks or a month and we'll go back out again. And you get a chance to recharge. Back to what you were saying about how bands and artists, you know, almost never pay back whatever their debt is to the record company. I think the best example, because it's not just, you know, music, but actors and whatnot. I think it was Paramount or Universal. I don't remember which studio it was. They told whoever the dude who plays George McFly, I can't remember his name right now, but they told him that the reason he doesn't get residuals on that film is because that film still hasn't made a profit. And I'm talking about back to the fucking future. Uh -huh. So like <laughs> there's creative ways to never be able to pay off your debt, like you were saying. And it is the, I guess, legal version of loan sharking or whatever the fuck. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a cool story about pizza boxes and less than Jake records. Yeah. So I worked at the pizza place. We wrote a song called Rock and Roll Pizzeria. Pretty much everybody that worked at the pizza place in Gainesville called Gumby's, we were all in bands. So if you were working the morning shift, there, there was guys that were still coming in reeking of last night's festivities. And it was the one job that you could do, deliver pizzas and still kind of make your own schedule and have a band. So we did this song and I had found out through my job, their distributor, and they got like a bulk deal on it. So we got a thousand pizza boxes shipped to my apartment. Full size pizza boxes? Um, it was like a 12 inch, like a medium sized pizza. Okay. Is this thing going to be on video or is this just audio? Just, just audio. Okay. I was going to, I was going to hold up the box. I got it behind me, but we hand screen. So we, we had a screen press and we hand Don't screened. be selfish. You can hold it up for me. <laughs> we did, uh, <laughs> we did a, a thousand hand screened pizza boxes. So we, we screened our, our name on it, the names of the songs. We put a record in there with two songs, rock and roll pizzeria. And it had another song on the flip side. There was a refrigerator magnet with our phone number to our apartment. Whoa. Yeah. People were calling it all the time. It was great. They're like, this isn't really Vinny. This isn't really Chris. Like, what? Hey, it's Roger. What's up? You know? So it had a refrigerator magnet. It had a napkin that we printed it on. It had a menu that came inside of it uh, with all our mail order of our other vinyls and stuff that you could order through us. What else came in there? I think that was it. So yeah, Rock and Roll Pizzeria did 1,000. We sold them. <laughs> this is the funny part. We sold them for $4 a piece. That was postage paid. So we didn't make really anything. That was our whole thing in the early days was get as much cool product as you can out with the collectors because we were collectors ourselves. Uh, you know, if you can get those people, we call them collector nerds, and you don't know how many of them follow our band. They love the toy aspect and the animation aspect and just the wackiness of all these crazy merchandise items we've done over the years. So, you know, we've kind of built a career around that. So <laughs> we did the record. It was four bucks a piece. And that pizza box is going for two or three hundred dollars right now online. That is so crazy. Yeah. Back to. um you know, you weren't really trying to do it to make money. You were just trying to get some really cool shit out there with your name on it. I have to imagine that's kind of how the Vans deal is, right? I mean, it was limited to like 250 pair or something like that. And I can't imagine you're making a ton of money on that. It's just another cool thing to have your shit on. It's another cool thing. The money that we did make on it, it goes back into the band fund. So it's funny. We're running a business, you know, and, and when we started this, we knew that. We didn't want to, to admit it to ourselves as a young bunch of guys, but we knew 
Because that young as a band, you don't want your fans thinking, oh, you're doing this all for a business, but what are you doing it for? Like, yeah, we love playing music for the love of punk rock and for the fun. But, you know, after those first 20 gigs of getting free beer and it's all being fun, at some point it's like, well, why are we really doing this? Yeah, we're getting a real kick out of this. Yeah, there's some money to be made. Let's be savvy. Let's at least think about this. That was that collective think that we all had going together. And, you know. I'll go back to what I said earlier. It's all about meeting the right guys and having the right people that share the goals. So with the Vans thing, we're running a business. The check comes in. Let's say we made $1,800 profit on that, whatever it was. It wasn't a lot, okay? That just goes back in the band fund. It gets spent on flights for the next tour. It gets spent on when I, I didn't get a personal check cut to me from Vans. You know, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, I saw money from it. My company saw money from it. But we just do these small little projects throughout the year and we go out on the road and it keeps it interesting for the fans. It keeps it interesting for us and it keeps the lights on. Love it. This is going to sound like a weird question. Why did you kind of, I guess for the most part, keep your last name a secret for so long? Like even on your records, it just says like Chris. (laughs) Yeah. It was the punk rock thing to do back then. You didn't put your last names. And for years there'd be newspaper publications be like, or or on TV, we have to have a last name. You can't just be Chris. And we would make up, I'd be Chris Lee Roth. Like David, I I was Chris Van Halen for a while. As you know, we all use just ridiculous. We make up names on the spot. That's the only thing. And I've said this numerous podcasts and interviews over the years. That's the one thing that if I could go back and change, I would. The only thing about my career is I would have, I hate the term, but I would have branded my last name so people know who I am because I'm doing this podcast, as you know now. Krista makes a podcast, the songwriting podcast. And it's like the hardest challenge for me is getting people to know who Krista makes is. Once you realize, oh, it's the guy from Less Than Jake, Chris. Oh, okay. You know, so that's the one thing I would change. I go go back and put our names in the records. <laughs> At least my last name. <laughs> yeah, that does have to be hard after decades of kind of hiding your identity to get people to realize, hey, that really is you. Mm-hmm. I don't lament over it. I can't change it. You know, and I, and I don't have any regrets. It's not even a regret. It's just something that happened. But if I could go back, I, I probably would have put my last name, knowing what I know now. Sure. You wrote a book called Blast from the Past. Why and what's it about, man? So it's a 365, well, that was how many days it was. It's more ended up being more pictures than that. Basically, I came home in the fall of 2018 from a tour with Less Than Jake. And I had recently moved and I was going through just memorabilia and things for the band. I, I have a you know, I'm in my studio right now. So I have pretty much everything less than Jake's ever put out. And I had this box of pictures I was kind of going through and organizing old pictures. And I came across one. I thought, oh, this is great. So I posted it on Instagram and I wrote a little story with it. And I jokingly said, I'm going to post one picture a day from the past called Blast from the Past with a little accompanying blurb story about it. Uh, and I'm going to do this until I pass Roger in Instagram followers, our bass player. It was just a joke, right? Lo and behold, our sax player, JR, had written a comment on that first picture. He says, oh, this is great content, but you won't make it for more than a week. And I said, I'll show you. I'm going to do it for a year straight. And I did. And I was about three weeks in. So that was December 5th of 2018. I finally finished up with the last picture, December 4th, 2019. I had... 365 days, and some had multiple pictures on it with accompanying stories to it that I then bound into a book. And it's the greatest toilet read ever put in print publication. What made you decide to turn it into a book that it would be available to other people? Well, I always wanted to write a book and I put pen to paper a number of times. I had consulted some friends who have written books. David McWayne from Big D and the Kids Table had said, this is how you do it. You're going to want to start with an outline and you're going to want to figure out what parts of your life you want to. And I kind of figured it would be that way. And I've read, that's my big thing. I read uh, rock and roll biographies and autobiographies. I have hundreds of, I've written, I've read every, every one of them and I love them. So mine, mine was starting to read like all the other ones. I got a, maybe a, a chapter or two in, I, you know, Hey, I'm Krista makes I'm from Livonia, Michigan. I was born blah, blah, blah to these parents. And then I moved to Florida and I, and I was like, man, you know, like I love my life prior to the band, but things really got interesting and crazy and chaotic and hectic. You know, when I got into this band, 
And I'm like, that's really where the story is. And the pictures didn't go in any chronological order at all. It jumps all over the place. There's a little bit of everything in the book. And um, I like the, the schizophrenic manner of the way it was put together because that's how the band's been. It's been nuts. It's just been 30 years of I don't know how the hell we got to where we're at, you know. And I always wanted to write a book. I, again, put pen to paper and I was like, this is just kind of ho-hum. And then when I got three weeks into posting these pictures on Instagram, the light bulb went off. I said, I'm writing my book one story at a time. The arduous process was then, uh, and my producer from Chris Makes a Podcast, Chris Fafalius, he helped me edit and rewrite everything. Because the stories sometimes were told in in a weird way because I was explaining them on Instagram and there was little anecdotes that maybe didn't need to be in the book. So we went through and edited and went through the grammar and everything together. That took probably 80 hours of nonstop going through that. So got smart punk records to release the book and uh, it's done well. We take it on the road with Less Than Jake. We sell it. It's great. I think that the manic nature of how it's not chronological, it's just kind of, you know, all over the place. I think that's super punk rock. Yeah, it's cool. I hadn't really seen anybody do, I, people have of course done picture books, but this was a little different, a little left to center and people like it that have read it. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. If I understand correctly, Less Than Jake has played more Vans Warped Tour dates than any other band. First off, is that right? That's true. We've done 340, no, excuse me, 441 Warped Tour shows. So there's 365 days in a year we've played about a year and four months. That's not counting all the travel days to and from and all the off days all those years. So we're looking at probably two years of my life has been Warped Tour centric. (laughs) What do you think that kind of exposure did for the band? It was huge. I'll use the term till in the soil. Where else could we get up in front of a new crowd every two years? A new batch of 13, 14, 15, and 16 year old kids that in a lot of instances had never been to a concert before. And we were their first band. The last full warp tour we did was four years ago. It was the summer of 2018. And we'd be out at our merchandise booth signing records. And these kids would come up, teenagers would be like, I've never heard you. Are you a new band? It's like, yes, we are. We're brand new. Nice to meet you. You know, I'll take it all day long, you know. And I think there's something to be said about the youthfulness and the energy of the band still. I think when you hear the music, it's only dated if you know who we are and maybe know that time period of sound. But if you weren't born when we started in the 90s and you don't know that this is an older style of music that's still around, I think it would sound fresh to your ears and you may not peg it as guys in their mid 40s playing this stuff. Agreed. I think that there's new fans born every day. For some reason, even with the internet and all the social media we have, there's still so many people that have never heard shit that's 20, 30, 40 years old. There's a whole series on YouTube of like people who have never heard it. I guess they're called reaction videos or some shit where like, uh-huh. you know, somebody is, has never heard, uh, never going to give you uh, or whatever, or didn't even know that that guy was white, whatever. Like there's just yeah so much stuff that people doesn't know it existed because it was quote unquote before their time. And I think one of the, you know, sort of cool kid things to do is to, either in earnest, like honestly not know about something that was before their time or just say it because it's the cool thing to do. But I know about World War II. I wasn't around then. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) While we're still talking about Vans Warped Tour, from your vantage point, I can't imagine a better person to ask this question. From your vantage point, how much and in what ways did the Warped Tour change from the beginning of the Warped Tour to the end of the warp tour uh it, it just grew with sponsorships really you know there was not many sponsors on the early besides fans it just grew to where now there was a verizon booth and now there's this booth and you know it got more philanthropic as well there was a lot more causes that were showing up on the warp tour and planned parenthood and all kinds of different organizations would come out and be part of the run so it, it just grew you know there was I think the first Warped Tour in 97, there was like bands, truck drivers, catering people, everybody. It was like maybe three or 400 people. That seems like a lot, but it grew to about 12 or 1300 people near the end. That is a lot. 
almost quadrupled. Yeah, it was it was basically moving a small rural town around every day and you'd wake up and the whole circus would be set up again. It was a really, uh, really cool thing. Well, I'm glad that you got to be a part of that. That's a section of history that it's going to go down in history as one of the greatest musical tours. It's in the echelon of of Woodstock. I mean, it's so revered. The fact that there were so many shows, so many bands, it went on for so many years, and it was super successful in breaking bands and getting exposure for everybody. I think it's really cool that you guys got to be a part of the entire story of it from beginning to end. That's just dope as shit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We're going to take just a little bit of a sidetrack here. A few years ago, you started writing jingles and songs for people like privately, not like, hey, I'm going to I dedicate this song to whoever like you specifically write songs for people. Why did you start doing that? And how's that going? So I came home from tour late November, December of 2019. And a fan was having a really hard time, a super fan of the band. She had been coming to see us since she was a kid. She was now a nurse with three daughters, a husband, and she had lost her father a couple years prior. And she basically just said that her life stopped when her dad passed away. She's been depressed. She's tried everything. Nothing's working. And could you write a song based on like this poem and these ideas that I have? And I, I said, sure. So I got down in my studio one night and I created this song and, and I, I wrote it. And I basically, I told her, tell me all about your dad. You know, let me know what you'd like to be included. Tell me some personal things. And I did it. And I sent it to her and she just, I mean, lost her mind, was, you know, emotional, loved it, asked me what she owed me. I said, you don't owe me anything. I said, you've paid to see my band plenty of times and bought enough merch. Just, you know, this is the least I could do. And she said, no, she insisted, let me have your PayPal, whatever. And she sent me an amount of money that I just about fell over. I was like, okay, the light bulb kind of went on, went on. And it's funny because this was about four months before COVID shut everything down. And so I put it out there that I was doing this and I got clobbered 15 to 20 song requests deep. I've been for the last two and a half years going on three years now. It hasn't stopped. I've done everything from business jingles, podcast jingles, uh, people wanting songs for their children, for their newborns, for anniversaries, for birthdays, for retirement parties, bar mitzvahs, you name it. And it's been awesome to connect with fans. I've had songwriting services that have artists that provide this service, reach out and want me to come be part of their thing. We can get you to a wider audience. And I'm just very blunt. I'm like, I couldn't have a wider audience. I can't write the songs fast enough. It's been a really wonderful thing. And plus, I love connecting with the fans one-on-one. They email me. They get a personal thing. We create the idea, sometimes the title for the song together. They're as much of the process as I am writing the song because without them and their subject matter, I couldn't create the song. So it makes people feel like they're part of it. And it's great. I just wrote my 252nd custom song. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. You can go on my YouTube page and, and check it out. It's uh, I don't think the handle it, YouTube just was able to give y- your own handle. I think it, I just picked my handle. It's uh, type it in just Krista makes custom songs, but it's Krista makes official. That's who I am on YouTube, and you can find all my well, not all of them, but people will put together collage photo videos and, and regular video, and, and they'll put my song behind it, and uh, it's cool. Go check it out. That is super super cool. Okay, now where do you live right now? Are you back in Port Charlotte? No, no. I'm, I've been in Tennessee for five years. Oh, okay. I live up here. Yeah. Do you have a real estate license in Tennessee? I still retain a Florida real estate license. My dad was in real estate forever. I did it. And it was a really, really cool story. <laughs> it was funny when I got my real estate license and I went public with it. You're like, well, man, the band must not be doing well, you know, this and that. And there's a lot of guys in rock and roll. Uh, AJ, singer from Lit. He has a realtor license. AJ Popoff? Yeah. Uh-huh. I just had Jeremy on. Yeah. Probably two months ago or something. Oh, rad. Yeah. So a lot of guys do it in the side. I did it for about a year down in Florida. I did well. It's all about who you know and name recognition. But I haven't sold a house in about six years. But I still have my license. And it's something if I ever wanted to go back and do, I, I could. Sure. Now, I want to talk about one of the coolest things that I have found in a long time. Feel free to kick back. This is going to be a minute. <laughs> 
<laughs> your podcast, it's called Chris to makes a podcast is to me somewhat unique in that you have people come on the show like Mark Hopp is from Blink-182, Chris Caraba from Dashboard Conventional, Dickie Barrett from the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, even Kip Winger from Winger. And previous guests of my show, Chris Ballou from the President of the United States of America, and one of my favorites, Scott Russo from Unwritten Law. And you have these people sit down with you, and you analyze, and you do a technical breakdown on a very specific song. And you break it down lyric by lyric. You break down the melody, the drum patterns. You say crazy shit that I... As a non-musician, I would never have even thought of. You say shit like, you know, I hear a chorus of guitars that comes in from the left and kind of goes through to the center and then exits out the right. And I'm just like, what the fuck? And then I listen to, because you play that part of the clip right after you say some weird shit like that. And then I'm like, holy shit, that is true. But you also do weird shit like occasionally you'll even be like, so there's this sound that's in this song and I can't figure out what it is. And it sounds to me like this and it sounds to somebody else like that. What is it? What is that specific sound? It is the dopest podcast about music I've ever heard. I really, really think it's super unique in the way that you break it all down with the person who wrote the song. It'd be one thing if it was just you and me talking about how much you like the song and it's all cool. But you sit down with the person who wrote the song and you bring to light such insight and such technical knowledge and skill. And sometimes you get really cool, crazy ass stories out of it. Like, well, you know, though this lyric is because of that and blah, blah, blah. I had no idea that Seeing Red by Unwritten Law was written from the perspective of Scott's at the time wife, Jody. That blew me. It gave me chills when I heard that. Like, I would have never heard that on any other podcast, but the way you break it down and ask what's behind this, what's behind that, what were you thinking here, what were you thinking there, that's how we get those really, really cool stories. So that was a super long way of me saying, everybody listening, Streetwalkers, go check out Chris Demakes, a podcast. It's everywhere that you get podcasts and it's dope as fuck. I want to know why you decided to start a podcast and why you decided to do it in this manner. Yeah. So it was the custom song thing, really. So I had reached out to Chris Fafalias, my producer of the show. He does animation. And Chris plays bass and punchline, a uh, band from Pittsburgh. I've known Chris forever. He had done this animated video for a Bowling for Soup Less Than Jake tour that we did in the fall of 2019. So it's kind of fresh in my mind. I said, hey, I want you to put together a cartoon animated thing of my custom songs. I'm going to do a promo. And I did like a minute long promo with all these different styles of songs I can do. He put it to uh, uh, animation. And we were on the phone one day, Tommy, he goes, hey, man, you should start a podcast. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I've done every horrible interview in my life and anyone can do a podcast. There are a dime a dozen. And most of them are really, really not that good. At least the ones I had heard. There's a lot of great podcasts out there, but as I said, anyone can kind of do one and, and some are, uh, to put it nicely, way better than others. So I, I was kind of just disinterested. I never really listened to podcasts, minus a blurb here or there. If I was on some music site, they're like, hey, this guy did an interview and I wanted to hear what he said. I'd, I'd tune in and usually would just forward to the part in the episode. I wouldn't even listen to the whole thing. You know, it was so he said, this would all tie back to your songwriting. You should really think about it. And I was like, okay. And I was just really dismissive about it. We hung up and just the rest of that day, I don't know what it was. It was one of those things that you just kind of can't explain. It's just kept eating at me in a really good way. I couldn't shut it off. And I woke up the next morning. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. And it wasn't even because we were a month into the pandemic at this point when we thought of the idea. It was more about, it, there was something about it that wasn't just, okay, I'm bored. I'm going to do this. There was a lot of guys starting a podcast. I said to myself, if I do this, I'm going to do it in, at least until this pandemic's over, which at that point, everyone thought, okay, this is going to last two months, three months, maybe. Um, <laughs> we all know what happened. But I said, I'm going to see this through. And uh, I was right. Most of those podcasts that started during the pandemic, a lot of the guys in, in music, uh, they just fell off after a little while. I was determined to see it through. And uh, I told Chris, I said, I don't want this to just be something where I'm BSing with people. That, you know, He's like, no, no, no. It's going to be about songwriting. We're going to break down an iconic song from that artist's career. And I was like, okay. So I woke up that next morning, went to my phone, and I just cold texted like a dozen guys. And I got immediate responses back. One of the first ones was John Feldman from Goldfinger. He ended up being the first episode. 
Jared Reddick from Bowling for Soup, Chris number two from Anti Flag, the number of my friends. That's how it started. And so I started doing these episodes. And then from the get go, the reaction was incredible from the fans. It was incredible. It was something that is akin to when. You know, we were out on that first tour for Pezcor and we were just showing up to VFW halls in New Jersey and there was 300, 400 kids showing up like what's going on here. And there was just something electric from the time I started the show that I said to Chris, I said, I don't want to be a punk rock podcast. I don't want to have diminishing returns at some point. There's only so many punk rockers I can interview. It's going to burn out. I really want to branch out. and, And that's why we anyone with a great song and a great story I'll have on the show. As evidenced by, I didn't even mention it. I mean, I did mention Kip Winger from Winger, who's definitely not punk, but you have Huey Lewis, dude. What the fuck? How did you get Huey Lewis? Oh my God. I know. I thought all he does is fly fish in Montana. How did you get him? It's really, you know, funny. It's all about connecting the dots. You know, I know a lot of people in this business and somehow everyone knows everybody. It's about connecting those dots. So Huey's tour manager used to sell t-shirts for Real Big Fish, Matt Frawley. And <laughs> I remember he was out with Huey. I just hit him up and he said, yeah, let me see what I can do. And, and that's how that transpired. So thanks, Matt. Um, and that's how a lot of these have happened. And the other thing I didn't know when I started this, is I never had really tried. I mean, you know, the, the band always reached out to people as a collector. But Krista Mix never really did. Whoever that is. We exactly. And I really didn't know. Yeah. I really didn't know if the guy from Less Than Jake could get a phone call or an email back from people. And nine times out of 10, I do. And usually it's it's good. It was surprising. And from there, it's just been about, again, I'll use the term connecting the dots. And, and here we are two and a half years later. I'm at about 140 episodes. It comes out every Monday. It's called Chris D Makes a Podcast. It's a playoff when I was a kid. Everyone was like, oh, Chris to makes a pizza, Chris to makes a pie. And I, so I was like, okay, Chris to makes a podcast, which it's funny. People think it's like Krista, a woman's name. Krista makes a podcast. I've heard that. But now we're two and a half years in. It's been branded. That's the name of it. I'm not changing it. I love it. Chris D makes a podcast. There you go. So without giving a name, is there anybody who you've asked and they basically said, go fuck yourself? No, nothing like that. Yeah, there's been tons of people we've asked. The fight is always the struggle, I should say, is, you know, a lot of these artists are just so much bigger than my podcast. It's going to benefit me way more than it's going to benefit them. And, you know, during the pandemic, because I had time, you know, yeah, I was busy with songs in the podcast, but I was also trying to promote those things. So I did every podcast under the sun. It didn't matter if they had 10 listeners a week or if they had 10,000 listeners a week, I was doing them. And I didn't really care from that aspect of, oh, I'm a bigger name than this thing. But there is some artists that, you know, um, I hit up Ice-T's manager and I was just like, hey, we toured with Ice-T before we did tours with Body Count. I'm in less than Jake. And it was just like, no, (laughs) I didn't even say, hey, thanks for it. No, you know, I just kind of giggle at it. There's nothing I can do. The only thing I can do is hope to uh, continue pushing the boundaries of the show and it gets big enough to where I could someday maybe get iced tea. I think you are pushing the boundaries. I mean, you know, I mentioned, I don't know why I keep saying his name, but I mentioned Kip Winger and Huey Lewis, but I mean, you got guys like Daryl McDaniels from Run DMC. Like Mm -hmm. that is way outside of those first 12 people that you reached out to or whatever. I think you're pushing the limits of the box, if there is a box, in ways that make sense for growth and for knowledge. Like, this is a songwriting podcast, and not everybody writes a song the same way or for the same reasons, uh, or obviously in the same style. I think it's dope as shit. Do you take suggestions? Well, I'm sure you do. You got to probably have a fucking stack of requests, right? Yeah, we actually have a Facebook group. It's called Chris Makes a Podcast Facebook group. There's over 4,500 members in there right now. So we're constantly, there's a main thread in there of what artists would you like to see? There's like, I don't know, thousands of comments in there of people. So yeah, we keep a list and we actively go after them. But guest acquisition is the hardest part of this, is, is getting the guests. That's That takes the most time. Sure. Well, there's a super easy one, which I'm sure is on that list. Why don't you interview AJ Popoff about My Own Worst Enemy? Well, if you would go back in my episode list, you would find that I had him and Jeremy both on talking about that very song. Oh, what a fuck face. Yes. Already got him. Already got him. Well, guess who's listening to that today? I'm so sorry. Well done. Now, 
I can't imagine that you're going to have him on again anytime soon, Chris Ballou. But at the very end of that episode, you and the other Chris, your producing partner, he mentioned that Chris Ballou has put out 19 albums of children's songs. Yes. And on my show, we talked pretty heavily about that because it's such an, a massive body of work. And, you know, we went through why he did it and all that stuff. But there's a song, and he let me play it on my show, which was super rad of him. There's a song called Even Bugs Are Sleeping that the way he tells it, he wrote that song with a co-writer. And that co-writer is the ghost of Kurt Cobain. That is a really super dope story. Everybody should go check that out. But even more cool than the story is that song even bugs are sleeping he does write children's songs but he writes children's songs that won't make parents want to tear their hair out you know he doesn't write baby shark dee, 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 dee. he doesn't do that he writes actual songs that adults can enjoy it's just coming from a children's perspective so everybody go check especially you chris go check out the song even bugs are sleeping it's super dope as we're heading out, is there anything I didn't ask you or we didn't talk about that you wanted to cover today? Did I miss anything specifically? No, that's really it. You know, I do the custom songs. If you'd like one, uh, like info on that, hit me up at chrisdemakes at gmail.com. That's chris, D-E-M-A-K-E-S at gmail.com. The podcast is Chris Demakes, a podcast. Please, if you haven't already, join the Facebook group. You can find me on Instagram at less than Chris D. And less than Jake is still out there. And thanks for your support. And this is the craziest shit. October 21st, 2023, the When We Were Young Festival in Las Vegas, it's already sold out. Yes. That is amazing. We will be there. You can get on a waiting list to get tickets. Chris Demakes from Chris Demakes, a podcast, and Lesson Jake, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic songwriting for people schedule to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street, man. I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. You have a great rest of your day. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Right on. Be good. And uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.